Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very, very special event by Little Otter, When to Worry. I am so honored to be here with all of you to discuss these very important issues surrounding all of our children and families. My name is Nicole Ryan, and I'm just going to start by telling you a little bit about myself, and then I'll throw it over to our lovely panel to have them give you a little deeper dive into who they are and how we all got here today. So I work at Sirius XM Satellite Radio. I'm on the channel Sirius XM Hits One, and I work on the morning mashup every morning. I also have a parenting podcast where I discuss our uh, our little critters every <laughs> week. It's called Have Kids, They Said. It'll be fun, they said. And I'm just really excited to be here. I'm going to introduce Dr. Helen Egger, who is Chief Medical Scientific Officer of Little Otter and a pioneer in the field of child psychiatry, having spent 30 years of work as a leader in childhood mental health. Dr. Helen is a world-renowned expert in early childhood mental health and digital pediatric mental health research. And over here, we have Evan Kyle Berger and Kevin LaFerrier. They're comedians turned dads whose content focuses on the comedic, comedic relief side of parenting, which we all need, I think. Um, and they both have very young children and amazing podcast called A Dumb Dad. So um, Dr. Helen, why don't we just start with you and you kind of can give us a little bit more background about yourself. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks so much for coming together. This is so important with National Child Mental Health Awareness Week that we do everything we can to get the word out on how to support kids and families. So I'm a child psychiatrist, but I'm also the mom of four. So I'm, you know, we're going to be talking as sort of expert parents and um, as well around our own experiences around mental health with our children and ourselves and how we can help other folks. I just want to mention that Little Otter, which is an online digital mental health company for kids zero to 14 and their kids um, and their families, I co-founded it with my daughter. So um, as we say, it's uh, made by a family for families. I love it. Okay. And the dads, why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little more background on yourself? Yeah. Just next time, can we um, be before the doctor with the a million accolades? <laughs> I apologize. That is, that's that's my fault. I'm sorry. You really, you really yeah, should have gone first. <laughs> I won't let it happen again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Luckily, this isn't live. Let's go again. Um, <laughs> we need to. Uh, so uh, we're we're two dads that uh, stay at home parents, um, and while we're doing that, we decided to start a podcast and uh, talking about the the truth of parenting. It's just a real, honest conversation, and then we started expanding that into social media and making uh, sketches, kind of based on our real life events of what we've been going through as parents and uh it's it's amassed quite a following of people that we didn't realize are, are also getting a lot of uh picking up a lot of wet food yeah oh, yeah yeah <laughs> um it's 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 crazy how we're all sort of in this together this like insane life that is having kids i know mm -hmm. you guys so kevin you've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old Evan, mm -hmm. you've got a seven-year-old and a three-and-a-half-year-old. I have an eight-year-old and a um, five-and-a-half-year-old. We're really in it right now. We're really <laughs> in it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Helen, I know you're-, you're I'm, I'm are... a survivor, so I'm Yes, here. you're a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> we bow but down to you, I've got all four of my kids out to college, so I, I can tell you that you will survive, your children will survive, and- <laughs> you do get to a different place. But I think we can really jump in and sort of kick it off with, we all just sort of came out of a pandemic, pandemic slash we're still sort of a little bit in it. But I mean, the real last two years, the real hardcore, our life being turned upside down, it's affected everybody, not just our children, but our families. And it's scary sort of to watch. And I remember when I when it first started happening, we first went into lockdown, I, I knew it, like, I was like, even just when it was the first couple of weeks, I was like, this yeah. is going to affect them, even just these few weeks. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, can we speak on a little bit about maybe what's happened to our families and maybe some of the lasting effects we're starting to see now that things are semi getting back to normal? Do you, do you all want to start with that? Why don't you? Dads. Dad. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think... Um... When we, when the pandemic first started, like you said, Nicole, it was it's very much like this is gonna this is really gonna change our daily life. Even if I mean, we kind of remember them saying like this could be as much as two weeks. Everyone should prepare, you know. And then here we <laughs> are, here we are, two years later. But I think I mean we had conversations with our family saying like the only way we're going to get through this with each other is just to be present with each other and and talk a lot because 
of course, this is also like a pandemic like this is none of us have really gone through something like this before. Mm -hmm. So navigating through that as parents, but also just people felt like a lot at times. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest thing I've found with my children right now is when we're trending back into what we would think is somewhat normal, separating separation anxiety is like a, is very present. Just my daughter, especially is three. And if my, my wife, I mean, usually I'm the one to go take my son to school, but if my wife does it, she's very aware that mommy's not home for 30 minutes. Yeah. You know? So something we try to focus on and try to have her do it once in a while, because it's sort of slowly do what normal life is again. But I mean, we definitely see in the children how even just being separated from mommy and daddy, who we've spent every hour with for the mm -hmm. last year, is going to be a big issue. Yeah, I, I definitely saw that. And and there was just so much fear. And we're supposed to be like, like all knowing and we make everything better and we take care of everything. And we didn't know, like we were afraid yeah. and still don't know. And that felt weird not to be able, like, I felt like I couldn't protect the way that I wanted yeah. to. And, you know, mm -hmm. socially them getting back. I mean, I'm just hearing from their teachers, all sorts of odd behavioral stuff that has yeah. been going on. What have you been seeing Dr. Helen as like a psychiatrist, you know, with patients and other families? Oh, well, you know, we were in a child mental health crisis even before the pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, one in five children has an impairing mental health disorder. 80% get no care. That was our situation before the pandemic. And then the pandemic has come. And I really think of it as a collective trauma we've all been through, right? I mean, there's the, the lockdown, no school, people have had, you know, impact on work. But also, Nicole, as you just said, the fear, right? Mm -hmm. The fear of, of illness, how long is this going to go on? Many families have been affected by illness and lost loved ones. Um, and that has had impacts everywhere. And I think what's really important to realize is the impact is on the whole family, right? And so we are seeing significant increases, unfortunately, in mental health challenges with kids. So particularly anxiety, like you just described about separation anxiety, depression, actually eating disorders as well. And, you know, we can talk about why these may be the specific disorders that are arising, but we are seeing a huge increase and we, you know, still people don't have a clear way to do two things. One, just as a parent, you're like, is this normal? Should I worry? Is it transient? Are we just making this transition back so we'll get through this challenging time and then my child will get back on track? Or is it something going on where we really need help from someone? And, you know, that's why we founded Little Otter. But also, it's so hard to get mental health care or to get quality mental health care. And, you know, that's why Little Otter is digital, because we know that you can live in communities where there's no one who specializes in what your kid needs. And so we want to be able to, you know, come to you where you live in your home and really be able to, um, you know, get you quick help. Because look, the earlier we help kids, the better, right? So yeah. it's, it's, you know, we're in this really tough situation, like, eh, are we just going to get through this and kids are going to be back on track? Mm -hmm. Or should I do something now? I, I don't know. You guys can speak to what you're feeling. I mean, even my kids are in college, so they lost yeah. two years of their college experience. So yeah. I'm asking the same questions that you're asking. Well, I mean, it's crazy. It's like my son, when we finally demasked to go back to school, he had yeah. never been in school without a mask. Yeah. Like that was so like, he came home and he said, I saw my friend's smiles. And I was like, oh, it's just, oh, it's like heartbreaking. And it's just like yeah. such, like you said, it's like PTSD. It's like a real trauma that they yeah. went through. And, you know, I've been on medication before for depression and anxiety from when I was young and I sort of have gotten out of that. And then, you know, the, the pandemic hit and I started feeling things again. And so I went online and got a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. But I said, I saw my daughter, you know, looking down one day and I said, what's the matter? She says, I just feel really sad and I don't know why. And mm -hmm. not that it mean, meant I needed to run and, you know, have her talk to somebody, but if it had escalated, I don't, what, where, where would I have gone? What would I do? Right. And that's why this is such an amazing platform. It's really, it's like sort of the answer to a lot of our. Well, and questions. you don't know what your child needs, 
right? Yeah. And we don't know either until we meet your family. And that's, we have actually something called the child and family mental health checkup. So really the idea of this is, you know, you could go to your pediatrician, right? If your child was coughing or something like that and say, I don't know what's going on, but can you do, let's do a checkup and see, but we don't really have that in mental health, right? So yeah. that's the first step in Little Otter is to answer that question. But Nicole, you said something so important. And this is why Little Otter, we say you don't bring a problem child to Little Otter, you join as a family. One of the best ways you can help children when they're having anxiety or depression is to get help for your own mental health challenges. I mean, that is, or if you're having a lot of conflict with your partner and there's a lot of fighting at home, I one think we might have all had a little bit of that during the pandemic. That, but one of the best ways you can help your child is to do couples counseling and really deal with those issues. And so that's why at Little Otter, we do child therapy, child psychiatry, parenting support, couples counseling, and we provide mental health care for parents for anxiety, depression, and ADHD. And so we can be a one-stop whole family solution. Yeah, it's the whole analogy of on an airplane when the masks drop, you put it over your face first and then you help, you know, your child. Kevin, were you seeing any any of this or anything different with your kids? Yeah, certainly. And it's hard to uh it's hard to push back. Like I know as like parents were always trying to like grow, uh being like, Well, I'm not gonna do that. You know, like how I was raised, I'm not going to do that. Yep. But there's also that element of it's hard to navigate with kids because like for yourself, it's uh, easier to advocate for like, I'm going through this, I need X help. And, but it's hard with your children to go, ah, oh, they'll get through it. You know, like yeah. even when you're trying to be as aware as possible, I still find myself catching myself just being like, well, this is a phase, like, well, let's get through it. And at what point, um, and that is like genuinely a hard, a hard task for my, me, my wife uh, to, sorry, this is my plane's landing. Um, <laughs> you need that private jet. Go we the plane just yeah. to go take a little vacation from the family. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to this place called Jurassic World. Um, <laughs> so um, it has been, it has been hard to navigate that idea of like what's been going on in the pandemic, um, the feelings that uh, my daughters had, like you said, Nicole, of, uh, of my daughter has just never been unmasked uh, at mm -hmm. school. Uh, she was in preschool and then that went remote and that was a dumpster fire. Uh, it was really bad. Uh, <laughs> we didn't like it. So we actually kept her out of school, preschool, uh, the following year. She was still too young for kindergarten because we're like, we'll just keep you home because that was bad for me and for you. Uh, I assume for the people on the other end of the computer. Yeah, uh, but now that we're in kindergarten, it's been really hard. There's been a lot of um, anxiety, a lot of, uh, you know, discomfort of like, you know, wanting to take the masks off before we had all of that and uh, us being like, we can't do that, but not wanting to also put the pressure on her of why, like you have to thread that needle with your kids of just going, you can't like we were um, we live with my wife's um, my wife's father and you know he's in his eight, he's almost eighty and it was hard to do that to do that thing of like well if you catch it and he catches it he could pass away right <laughs> right like I'm a parenting expert but I don't think you should say that not no. not yet. yeah no. like yeah. <laughs> not okay, a good yeah. thing to say to your baby. I wasn't sure. Uh, so it's been hard to navigate the idea of the pandemic uh, and trying to keep it um, um, not fun, but like, you know, keep it like you're still a kid. This is still your childhood. I, we're not putting that on pause. We still need you to have a wonderful uh, life and we want you to have fun memories and we don't want you to grow up with this trauma. So it's been this horrifying uh, line of work. You know, one thing I wanted to just highlight from what you said is we feel like as parents, our job is to nurture and protect our children. Mm -hmm. And what's so challenging in a situation like this is we could not protect our children from yeah. the impact of this. And it's, I think, important to think of it a little bit differently than sort of a trauma if there's a natural disaster or something. It's something that happens and is over. But I think what's made the impact of this so difficult is it just goes on and on. And there's so much uncertainty. Even Nicole, when you introduced it, it's like, 
it's over, but no, it's not over. (laughs) And so, and that's one of the things when we think about trauma, you can't really heal from trauma until the trauma is over. We're still in the coping with the stress and the trauma period and don't really know. And we know that that kind of chronic stress Mm -hmm. really takes its toll, not just on our mental health, it even just physiologically impacts Mm -hmm. our physical health as well. So I want to thank everyone for being here at this amazing little otter event, When to Worry. Just to let you all know, if you have any questions, you can go to the apps area in the suite. You can ask questions. We'll get to them in a little bit. There's polls that you guys can take. Um, So we just love all of that participation. But, you know, I think we've spoken on anxiety a little bit from this pandemic and even before the pandemic. You know, I think we all have dealt with tantrums. I think we've all dealt with acting out and it was only exacerbated by that. So, you know, I, I, my son was always my little devil. Um, he was always just my challenging child. My first was very easy. He was challenging and he was tough before and got even tougher after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it, it was all different things that were setting it off. I mean, he would literally lie in the, in the middle of traffic on first Avenue here in New York city because he just, he wanted to hold the apple we had just gotten from the grocery store. You know, it didn't really matter, no rhyme or reason. Yeah. But um, I think that this, did, it did make it worse and it made that they're just a normal, natural development stifled a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so whether he's frustrated with schoolwork, he just doesn't want to do it, which I don't want to push, or he's just frustrated with the answer no. Um, maybe you can speak on a little bit, Dr. Helen, how we should yeah, probably be I handling have lot, these I have so many thoughts about it. You should it. get your kid off First Avenue. <laughs> Pick him up. Yes. <laughs> Pick him up and get to the sidewalk. So <laughs> the first thing I think that I wanted to point out, and which anyone who has a second child knows, kids are born with their own personalities, and each of your kids are going to be different. So I think it's it's important to realize you can have a quiet, you know, child, and then you have a, you know, really high energy, rambunctious, spirited child. And that isn't in and of itself a problem, right? It can be challenging, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think so the first thing is just sort of realizing that each of our kids are going to be born with their unique personality, and it's going to take different parts of ourselves to, uh, parent this child and all the children. strength in the all world the to get through the the world. Yeah, exactly <laughs> but i think the next question and this is fundamental to why we call this when to worry we do have ways to be able to distinguish between what are kind of variations in typical behavior and so i'll say you know look 75% of three-year-olds have tantrums. So obviously tantrums are normal. And even if you're like, I know this is normal, but you're in the middle of First Avenue, First Avenue. and your child is tantruming and lying on the ground, you're like, help, please. I, I need help with this. Cause we don't know how, you know, nobody no. gives us a manual about how to do that. And so that's, you know, the first piece, and it's why when at Little Otter and through my whole career, we don't want to just focus when kids already have a mental health problem, right? The reason I do little kids, my work is in babies to six-year-olds, is that if we can identify challenges early and then give support to the child, we can really prevent um, a lot of impairment and problems later. But then if you ask a question like, well, when is a temper tantrum not a normal temper tantrum? And this is where (laughs) the work I've done as a researcher and I can answer that question for you. So if kids have a tantrum nearly every day and they hit, bite, kick or break something. So that doesn't mean slamming the door. That doesn't mean throwing a pillow. That means like smashing a cup that children, young children, two to six, who have these kind of frequent aggressive tantrums are eight times more likely than a kid who doesn't to have some kind of mental health challenge. But here's the thing. We think of this as bad behavior, right? It's a behavior problem. It's not. It is the kind of common denominator of a very distressed child. So those kind of aggressive hitting, all these things, 
it's as strongly associated with anxiety and depression mm -hmm. as it is with, you know, ADHD or something. And so that's why I call those kind of tantrums mental health fevers. It's just the same way. Like if your kid had a fever and you took them to the pediatrician, it could be a whole host of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why with these kind of mental health fevers, what I would recommend to parents is we don't know exactly what's going on, but this is enough of a warning sign that our child is not able to regulate his or her emotions and behaviors. That's, it's like a, it's, it's a true meltdown. Mm -hmm. And, and what's driving it? Is it fear? Is it sadness? Is it anger? Is it developmental delays that mean that they can't really, you know, develop, they don't have the skills to handle this situation. And, you know, so so that's that's just one example of, of as a parent, when you ask yourself, hmm, is this a phase or is this just, you know, the way things are or is this something that we could really benefit from? Yeah. Um, I mean, dads, you know, I don't know if you if you have exorcist style tantrums um, <laughs> with your kids or I'm sure you have. I think we all have yeah. um, maybe what have you seen? How do you deal with it? And um, sort of just a, a two-sided question. It, does Little Otter have like support groups? Like, like, can we go on and like talk to other moms yes. and dads just to kind of take the, the well, edge off? Well, actually, that's great that you asked that because we just started for uh, our Little Otter families an exclusive Facebook group okay. um, to be able to talk to other families. We also have parenting specialists who can focus, again, not on treating an anxiety disorder, but like how to make bedtime not the battle of the century, how mm. to deal with normal but demonic tantrums. Demonic. <laughs> Nicole, it was interesting you said your um, your child chooses the middle of the street. Mine chooses the middle of like, whatever store we're shopping in. Yeah. Just like oh, the, lovely. You know, lovely. Where the intersection of like departments and then usually yeah. in the center there where there's a lot of high traffic. So sort mm. of similar. I, but a lot no, of we, eyes. We never yeah. had like, my daughter has had tantrums. It's not been consistent, but it's been definitely when I see her doing it, it feels as though she she's she has it's lack of communication. She's very upset about something and she doesn't know how to communicate what that mm -hmm. is. It's and sad so, when that happens, kind of. I mean, you're angry, but like it's like I know they're that they just can't get it out. And yeah. They're overwhelmed. Yeah. They're overwhelmed. And and so I think it's also I to me, parenting is it's so much about perspective as well. Because when you when you think of it like that, it's so much easier to remain calm to in, in terms of where I'm coming from. Is this weird? Yes, we're in the store and people are passing by and you're like screaming that you don't want to go this way, but like we have a list of stuff we need to get and it's it's this way, you know. And so we just gotta let her kind of get it out for a moment and I'll walk over and just stand with her and you know. It's, she just, I just need, she needs to get out whatever she needs to get out. And then as soon as that happens, we can pick her up and continue. But, um, but that's so, so I just want to really highlight, I mean, in the way both of you are talking about your children is, I mean, the humor and the empathy for what this is like for your child. It, it does not feel good to completely lose it. Um, and have a complete meltdown. And it's scary for the child. It's upsetting. The other little piece of information, I know uh, we talked about this when I did your podcast, but don't ask your child to use their words when they are having a meltdown tantrum because Oops. they can't. <laughs> it's not possible. So think about a, think about it as a storm. The your brain is not working. Your cognitive, you know, doing rational things. Your word section of your brain is not working. So it's really around being present, containing it, obviously keeping your child safe. You can use the words after. I'm not at all saying you can't talk about things. It's super important. And sometimes you can use words before. Right. But think of it as a storm mm -hmm. and that nothing is really going to be going in um, to necessarily change it that much. And so Kevin, tell I, us about I, your I, storms. I use my words too. I mean, we've all done that. <laughs> like, tell me what's going on. But I mean, sometimes I'll say, sometimes I'll say, I'm sorry that you're so sad. I'm sorry that you're so yeah. angry. 
but yes, use your words comes out often. And obviously now I know maybe that's not the time, but Kevin, come on, let's just feel like we're all in it. Tell us about your worst horror story. I need to hear it. Uh, no, my the parenting's been super easy for me. I'm doing yeah, well. he's I'm getting, they're getting their little halos cleaned up in the shop. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I've been going through it. And with my, with my youngest, he's, he's at the same stage that Evan's daughter is at where, um, he, he almost like gaslights me. Um, I'll say it. He's not here. He can't defend himself. Uh, <laughs> but like sometimes, you know, it's just like, okay, well, we can't, we can't do that right now. Like we can't, I'm, I'm so, I know you want to have the screen time and then we have to do this. So we, we can't have the, we can't have the iPad right now. And then he will literally say, I, you, I can't ever watch the iPad is like his words before he goes into a full meltdown. Like, a full on gaslight of like, it's not what I said. It's yeah. not at all how I <laughs> yeah, communicate that words. to you. Uh, it was just a lot of a lot of that stuff. Uh, my daughter, how she recently has been uh, dealing with her uh, uh, her you know uh, overwhelmed feelings is, and I, again uh, we talked about this as well on our podcast. Uh, yeah. Helen is um, she will remove herself. Um, from the situation completely. So she broke her arm uh, two weeks ago. She was, uh, I know it was real. It was, uh, it was like the end of like spring break. We had some people over for Easter and stuff. And she was playing on this like uh, bouncy ball triceratops thing. And she just bounced off it. I watched mm -hmm. it happen. And the second she landed, I was like broken. Yeah. And like happens in slow motion. You're yeah. like, no. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, so as soon as that happened, you know, we pulled her aside, put ice on it. She's overwhelmed feelings. And she did what she always does, which was just like, I would like to go to my room. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went, okay, you can go to your room. And she's done it for much smaller things of just like, he, this person's not sharing or whatever her feelings are at the time. And for a while, until I talked to you, um, Helen, <laughs> I was like, what do we, this is bad. This is really, really bad. Cause she would just go to her room and we'd go in there and we'd like, we'd talk to her and like try to get her out of the room. Cause we're like, you're alone here. Yeah. Uh, it seems wrong. Like, you know, not telling her that, but like having that feeling in our head of just like, you're, you're alone here. And like, you feel like she was hermiting. Like she was going like being. Yeah. Like I felt like she was physically doing what I as a uh, Irish Catholic did my whole life, which is bottle it up, hold uh, it in, <laughs> hold it in, and tighten the cap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so she was doing that, but until I talked to you, Helen, uh, which was it was good that she was removing herself from the yeah. situation. Well, we, we talked about it as a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. right? I mean that, and and that she realized when she is getting over on this helps her recenter. I do think, though, that it's important to realize with all of these things, talking about bottling things up, that what can be coping mechanisms or skills at a certain point in our life may not continue to be useful as time goes along. So if with your daughter you were seeing that in the face of any conflict or something, she just withdrew and, you know, just didn't even want to engage, then you wonder that can turn into mm -hmm. some kind of avoidance, right? So right. it's always this sort of seesaw, right? What, where are things coping mechanisms? Where can they, you know, become something that can be a problem? And the answer is really, how is it impacting your child? That's what we always want to know about it. It's not just mm -hmm. the behaviors or the emotions, so if it was impacting her, for example, like she had trouble making friends, mm -hmm. right? Or something like that, then you would think, oh, maybe there's something here that's concerning. But if she's able to, after she gets herself together to sort of reconnect and, mm -hmm. and you know, to be emotionally connected to you, which I know she is, and manage things, then I think, you know, listening to your child's cues and listening to what as again, each child is an individual, right? Yeah. She's yeah. giving you the message. This is what I need. This is what I need at this moment. Yeah. And as you are doing and respecting that, and also making sure 
it really is good. You know, you don't yeah. want it. I mean, you know, kids are little. They, yeah. they don't have the best judgment about stuff. So, you know, but doing that kind of back and forth, but really learning what what are the ways that she can manage her emotions, yeah. I think is is that's the kind of emotionally sensitive parenting that we know really helps children to learn to manage their own emotions and to be emotionally um, connected. Yeah, it's it's good. It's it's funny you say all that because um, I feel like this is a perspective I uh, got when I had a second child because yeah. I feel yeah. like I, I feel like you get this with if one child or ten kids like you get the, either way but it helps like with my second of seeing like oh this doesn't work that way anymore right yeah. you know, that doesn't work which helps you with the first kid too because i feel like there's that risk of falling into complacency of right. uh, well this has always worked let's continue doing it yeah, you can working. nurture all day long nature is gonna be <laughs> <always Yeah>. <laughs> exactly and i feel like with my second you know i have a daughter and then i have a younger son um with my son, a lot of stuff doesn't work and I'll keep you updated. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's not a good uh, progress report, but, no. uh, but it's been good because it, it also helps me um, go back to my first and be like, maybe that doesn't also, you know, it helps me like, uh, what is it like kind of do what I've been doing. Of, like, like a reset. Reset, that's the word. Thank you. Yeah. And and in terms of, of uh, nature, Nicole, even, I mean, my I, my youngest two, as I told you, are identical twin boys. And so they're, you know, their DNA is pretty much the same. And yeah. they are completely each individual. Yeah. So, right? Yeah. It's, it's a each each child is really different. And yeah. I think the other thing I wanted to, to pull out from this is when the things that should make us be concerned are when we see a big change in our child, right? So, so if a child, um, if you had a kid who was super outgoing and when they got upset, they just wanted to engage and cuddle and, you know, be comforted. Mm. And then that child changes to be withdrawn, isn't enjoying the things that he used to enjoy or is isolating in his room and that it's impacting, um, could be impacting sleep or eating, but also most importantly, functioning, right? Mm -hmm. Like is, is this impacting wanting to be involved in sports teams or other extracurriculars, grades, seeing friends, you know, these are the things that we really want to look for when there's change. And with little kids, we also want to look at how is it adversely impacting our family mm -hmm. okay so it's one of the things you know talk about like you could have a kid with separation anxiety who you know never goes out for a play date sleeps in the parents bed follows mom or dad around even you know like sitting outside the bathroom door yes i do have a child with separation anxiety so i know all these things mm -hmm. um and but you're, that child isn't ever being challenged to separate. So they're yeah. not having symptoms, but your whole family is turned upside down. Upside down so yeah. You want to not just look at how kids' emotions and behaviors are affecting them. That's super important. But we also want to see how it's affecting the rest of the family. And that's not just parents, that's siblings. Yeah. That's something I think we forget is mm -hmm. if you had a kid who's having a really difficulty with aggression or hitting, well, we really need to get a handle on this because they're hitting their brother or sister and and we're scared they're going to hurt them or something yeah. like that. So I think you want to really pay attention to that when you're asking the question, should we get some kind of help? Well, it's it's cyclical too, you know, it's it's this, you know, especially during the pandemic, we would be frustrated with them because I mean, all, it already we've got so much going on in the world and then trying to control them. And then your marriage is possibly, you know, challenged yeah. by all of that tenseness and stress. And I mean, I remember my husband and I would fight in the middle of the pandemic. And then all of a sudden I heard my son say, please guys, please stop fighting. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. But it was like, everything was affecting. It was just like this round robin of, yeah. and I was like, this is not us. And they've already are going through so much. We cannot add to it. Um, 
but you know, they're all, everything is a manifestation of, of what they're going through, right? Like you had said, eating um, changes, sleeping changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I've been on the phone with friends and said, should I be worrying? Do I worry? Is this normal? Is this normal? Is like the main thing. And then then you Google it and you don't know who the heck the advice you're getting. And that's why we founded Little Otter because, Mm -hmm. you know, I've, been a child psychiatrist, it's horrifying to say it, but for over 30 years. And there is actually really good science and evidence base and knowledge that families just aren't getting. And so we at Little Otter really want to be the trusted place where you can come and know that what you're going to learn with us, um, you know, whether it's we have lots of free resources or it's you do a welcome call with us and figure out if if some of our services will help. You need to trust Mm -hmm. that you're going to be talking to people who actually know what they're talking about. And, you know, and again, it's not just as a child psychiatrist, I have four kids, but, you know, I also have my second child has a, a rare autoimmune brain illness, which he's now 26, but got sick when he was 13. So I've been on that journey of a, of a mom with a child. It turns out, you know, he had this autoimmune brain illness, but that, you know, you don't know and you worry and how do you get help? So at Little Otter, we really know, I mean, it comes out of my experience as a mom and as a mom with a kid with challenges. It looks like we lost Nicole. She- Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she'll be back. I, I, I was <laughs> gonna say just to, to on what you were saying, when my when my son first started showing signs of, of, of separation anxiety and just the overall, under, he's a very emotional boy. He wears his heart mm-hmm. on his sleeve. Yeah. He definitely um, got that from me. And at first when you, when as somebody with an anxiety, who's had it in my life and it's been in my family. Um, mm-hmm. um, when you're, when you become a father, I think, I hope he doesn't, I, my first th- thought is, I hope he doesn't have that. You want to spare him. You want to spare him. him. I want to spare yeah. him. And then those thoughts creep up in a very honest and real way when he shows signs that, that that's sort of how he operates yeah. emotionally, which is then familiar. And so then the perspective was kind of like, well, Maybe it's better then because I sort of know what I'm looking for. You I have know, empathy for I that. I have empathy for that, um, you know. And so that's kind of, that's just kind of how my perspective. And the interesting thing is, like when when we started partnering together, Helen with yeah. Little Otter, was shortly after when we thought, I wonder if he should talk to somebody. Maybe it might mm-hmm. just maybe just to check in and see yeah. if there's something that, you know, obviously an expert um, that could speak with them about it. And it was hard to find any company that was, there was a lot of, you know, um, offices we could get him appointments with, but then they asked how old he is. And he's like, well, he's six. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, yeah. so we really start talking to him at 12 or 13. And we thought like, yeah. that seems wild that there is just sort of no option out there. You know, it's, we well, found- there's a real, I mean, I think that's again, why at Little Otter, we focus on babies, toddlers, preschoolers, and up to 14. Because there's people don't know this. There's a huge, robust field of infant early childhood mental health. I mean, that's what my life's work has been. But people don't know it. And young children experience mental health challenges like anxiety at the same rate as older children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's just, I'm just going to say it, I mean, because it breaks my heart. It's just a crime that that we aren't identifying these challenges early because you know you think about your little boy you said that he wears his heart on his sleeve yeah being children who are highly sensitive have so many strengths it's both their superpower and a source of challenge it's never just yeah you know it's not just a bad thing and you know even in one of my studies children who these are little kids who had generalized anxiety which is worrying you know, I mean, I've had worriers also like, what if this, what if this, what if this? And it turns out that little kids, two to five, who are big worriers, they actually had a 10 point higher IQ because wow. they're like looking around like, there's a lot to worry about. Yeah. 
artist's world. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm noticing this and I have these powers of perception and I have no idea how to deal with it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it is interesting that like the whole being sensitive, it is kind of like, it's a blessing and a curse for yeah. anybody, I think, because, yes. you know, sometimes I do look at my son and I'm just like, why are you so sad? And he, he can't explain it. And I feel that way. Sometimes you really think about it. They're just a human being. Sometimes I just feel really yeah. sad and I don't know why either, mm -hmm. but also I think it's important to have this resource like little otter, because I don't know if you guys have had the same experience. Sometimes my kids, actually, most of the time, my kids are way better with anybody but me and my husband. Wow. So a teacher, I'll do a parent teacher conference and they're like, I'm like, well, how bad is it? And they're like, he's, <laughs> he's just so sweet. But, but Nicole, that is, I'm going to just tell you, that is so such an important piece of information because when children are, they're, they're always going to have their conflicts with their parents because that's their most intense relationship, right? But when these challenges aren't pervasive with yeah. other people or across different settings, that's a really good thing. So your kids are holding it together, yeah. right? And that takes a lot of energy when you're little, right? Like doing all the things at of school. Of course. And so then they're going to come home and- And melt. Oh, but that's also because they're safe. Yeah, it's, it's 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 because it's a safe place, and so that's something. When again, you're asking this question, should I worry or not? Right. You can look and say, is this something that's just happening at home and not elsewhere? Right. One caveat I do want to say to that, though, is there can be really difficult things happening in the home, mm -hmm. that, and so that it's not. I mean. Obviously, we hope that children are facing it, but there is child abuse, there are other domestic violence, there's various things. So, you know, sometimes we, you know, have to be very aware of what the home environment is and what's impacting the child. But yeah. in general, if they're losing it at home, keeping it together outside of home you know, that's a good thing. I love it. All right. So just a reminder, guys, make sure you go to the app section and you send your questions. We're going to start taking some questions now for all of us um, and, and also take the polls there. And our first one is from Sheila. Sheila says, do you have any advice for parents with children who have developed obsessive behaviors over the course of the past couple of years, for example, around germs and hand washing, which I think is probably a big one? Yeah, that's such a great question because I think we have definitely seen an increase in children's anxiety about getting sick, about, you know, contamination, illness, hand washing. Um, and so I think the way to sort of think about it is, is it something that as we're moving, you know, into this post pandemic -y sort of or, you know, next phase of it? and there isn't as much focus on it, is your child, um, you know, basically not having that obsession, right? If it's persisting, actually it can be an early sign of obsessive compulsive disorder, which actually we can diagnose in children. I mean, the youngest child I've seen with it is four. And the, the what we think about for OCD is when you have obsessions, hand washing would be an obsession, or, um, I mean, would be a compulsion to have to ha wash your hands or an obsession about getting sick or contamination. And this is taking up a lot of your child's time, mm -hmm. a lot of their emotional energy, and maybe interfering like they don't want to go to someone's house because they're worried about getting sick. Or if you're having a ton of conflict about it, then it's so important to get an evaluation because we do have really good treatments for obsessive compulsive disorder. And it can be a very impairing disorder if it's not treated. So, I mean, I remember one little girl I took care of whose hands were little, literally bleeding from how much she was washing. So those, it's when it gets to that extreme point that you definitely want to get some help. Agreed. On the on the on the other side of that, uh, how do we get them to wash their hands? <laughs> yes. yes, without me asking every and freaking time. And yeah, yeah. Well, how do we make that an obsession? <laughs> <How do we laughs> exactly. <put it> in there? 
Yep, <laughs> yep. I'm not. I'm not a miracle yeah. worker. No, <laughs> you are not. You are not. But we can dream, right? We yeah. can dream. Yeah. Okay. So this next question is from Christina, and Christina says, "My son is 16 months and has always had a temper. The older he gets, the more frequent frequent his mental health fevers get. Since he's younger than two, what can I do to help him navigate those feelings and reduce the frequency?" Great, great question. I think that the you know what we've talked about before in terms of really emotionally sensitive parenting is a key part of um, how to help your child also looking at what's happening before the tantrums mm -hmm. and see if there are ways i mean the best you know best thing to do is do whatever we can to prevent it right and things like helping to distract your child divert their attention or if you know there are certain things that are going to set them off, really plan um, how to not make that happen. But I also think for someone as little as two, and this is really of all uh, early childhood, you do want to make sure that there isn't anything developmental going on um, and make sure that your child um, at the pediatricians, or we do it at Little Otter, is being screened for autism, that's you know mm -hmm. one area that you want to make sure. Also, children can have hearing problems or other developmental delays that are making them very, very frustrated. Like children who are developing language a little bit more slowly mm -hmm. often have a lot of tantrums because they can't communicate, right? And they get really, really frustrated. So I guess my would have two pieces of advice in terms of what we offer at Little Otter in particular. One. We have amazing parenting specialists who can really help you figure out parenting strategies, you know, to manage very specific situations. And I think it's worth, you know, being able to just look and see what's going on um, from our, you know, mental health checkup to see if this mental health fever is a sign of something else. And that's something I'm super proud of. I have to say a little odder is, our screening is starts with babies as young as one month old, all wow. the way up to age 14. So we can really provide support and help even when your little ones are infants and toddlers. Um, yeah. And that, that's hard to find actually. It's, it's a- uh, Yeah, it's really refreshing. I feel like yeah. when my kids were that small, they were like, don't worry, you don't, you're don't, you not gonna know anything yet. That's but the like, thing you're gonna hear. But here's the thing, this is what I always say. They're like, let's wait and see. And right. if you have a three-year-old and they're like, let's wait six months. You wait too long. A sixth of that child's life. And, yeah. and so that's why we have to have good screening. Because if we have screening, we can say, oh, this is in the typical range. You know, okay. yeah, we can give you some parenting support. But we want to know right away yeah. as soon as we can if it's concerning. Because not because we want to worry. It's because we can help. Yeah. <laughs> We, we have things to help. That's the thing that I'm so passionate about is it's not like identifying problems. It's like, oh, my God, how can we help? How we, can we help your child? How can we help you? I was thinking about this the other day because my son, who's seven, he just yeah. got he just got braces on his top teeth. Yeah. Fun. And before, yeah, great. Looks like a mini <laughs> and, uh And before that, and he still has an expander that they put in the top of his mouth. Yeah, we have one of those, too. That's fun, too. Oh so now I never had braces and close up photos. You can, it's very obvious, yeah. but, but my wife um, had braces and an expander and like headgear and all this stuff. She had it when she was like, uh, I, I don't know, 13, 15 years old, like oh. not fun, really not fun years to have it. And what they were explaining to us at the orthodontist is that, yeah, we used to let them all come in and then react to that. Mm. Oh, and that's such a good, I love that. It analogy. is a good answer to Oh, that's amazing. Them to like see a picture of like what's going on. They're like, it's a pretty crowded room. We should make some space to allow that to happen. And then we can adjust how they come, you know, your adult teeth come in. And then, and I was like thinking about that the other day with Little Otter. And it's like, that makes Oh, I love sense. that. That is like, early intervention. I mean, early. Yeah, I'm sure it's easier to guide them into how they can, they can help them grow Definitely. or or learn to live with whatever disorder they may be developing um, as opposed to reacting to it, you know, later in life where then it's a lot of like deep dive as to why and all these, you know, these feelings. Oh, I think that that's such a, that's such a beautiful analogy. And, and you should write that down. 
for sure. I, I have already. I have, <laughs> I, I have written it down, but we will we will credit you. But um, <laughs> I, but I think it's it's really and it's one of the things that that is so frustrating in terms of, in a way, the silence and the stigma. It's about mental health in general, but children's mental health. Um, we know that. 50% of adult psychiatric disorders start before the age of 14. Mm -hmm. And we've known that for a long time. That's not like some new science. But still, we focus so much on these later on, you know, adulthood, and obviously critical with teenagers also, but we really, really neglect the mental health needs of, of little ones. Yeah. So I, I see we're getting a whole bunch of questions. We them. are. We are. They're coming in like rapid fire. I'm struggling yeah. to keep up. Let's move on. This one is from Kieran. We've got it's, it's sort of a two parter. So, what about kids who are older, like nine years old, and uh, they act out, throw tantrums, show signs of anxiety and separation anxiety? In my family, it's my oldest child who shows signs of mental health issues and was greatly affected by the pandemic. They started seeing signs when um, she was three. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I mis misread this? Oh yeah, we oh, thought she would grow out of it. And um, we started seeing signs when she was three years old. I've talked to the pediatrician, but she says it's due to her chronic constipation. I don't think that's true. Is there any advice you can give me? Yeah, and I think I think that's two different questions yeah. that we that we got. So I think the first one with kids who are nine, who are having tantrums, showing separation anxiety, it's critical to get a men mental health evaluation. I mean, if we're in your state, we're in California, Colorado, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, opening at the end, um, the 24th of May in New York, really mm -hmm. get a mental health evaluation. Because again, one in five children does have a mental health disorder and we have great treatment. So if you take anxiety disorders, the you know top treatment for anxiety disorder is cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and we you know again this is what sets little otter apart, apart i think is all of our treatments are evidence-based and they're based on the best research and the best science and we follow outcomes and make sure it's working right like sometimes you can go to a mental health specialist and you're like how are we going to know this is working yeah and at Little Otter, we're really passionate about making sure that we measure things and we can show it over time. But I would just encourage that mom, if there's any way you can get help for your child, that would be um, really, really good. And then this other question about seeing signs when a child is three, I hear that over and over again. And one of my, I think I talked about this with y'all um, another time, but I did a call-in show once and this 80 year old woman called in i was talking about early preschool anxiety she called in and said i had that when i was three and four and nobody paid attention and listening to you i think how my life could have been different mm -hmm. if there had been recognition and treatment and so i would i mean i i obviously your pediatrician is you know i mean i would not trying to counter what your pediatrician says. And I think um, going and getting an evaluation um, from a mental health, pediatric mental health professional would be really great. And again, if you register a little otter, we do, we have a, an assessment It only takes like five mm -hmm. to seven minutes. And then we give you feedback about whether or not this is typical or whether it's concerning. Mm -hmm. And then can do a welcome call with us and we can we can help you yeah. to figure that out we partner with parents i think one thing i really want to emphasize is and this is from my experience with my child's illness is parents are the experts of their children so when you go to a mental health professional you come you know see me it's not like i have all the answers right. i have expertise in this area and then we're going to partner together to figure out what's going on. So you feel how, supported, right? You feel supported. This is not about blame. It's not about um, even, again, that we know your child better than you do. We don't, but we mm -hmm. have ways to ask the right questions. Right. And so I think that that idea of, of working side by side yeah. with your, you know, and with us, it's a team, we coordinate and integrate our care. 
that's what you want to look for. Because mm -hmm. as a parent, you need as much support through this journey as your child does. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, to piggyback off that, it's, it's interesting because as parents, like you don't even need anybody to say anything, but people do anyway. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, <laughs> but you, you, you do have this like, um, pride in your children and that you're always going to be hesitant always to get them mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. it's why mental health for adults is, um, you know, something everybody is pushing for, like, do it, do it, go talk to somebody, get what you need. And especially for your children, it's hard for people to go out there and, and get the care, the mental health care that they need, mm -hmm. because internalized stuff is, uh, mental health issues are something that is a quote, it would be a failure on your part as a parent. It's and like you're stigmatized. Right? And, yeah, and, and I think that's, um, we have to overcome that and you have to overcome that by having good experiences, right? And I, not, you know? Yeah. What I love, what I love about what you, you say, Helen, like I might, you've said it before and you just said it now about how parents are the real experts. Yes. I think that's such a good way to put it because I like to think of it as going to a mental health expert, you being the expert going to mental health expert is like when a, when a surgeon goes to another surgeon and is like, I'm going to perform this. What do you think about that? They get collaborate. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not a bad thing to have somebody else come in and it's a stigma no. that we yeah. break of going, you're still the expert. You're still a yeah. good parent, but sometimes you need someone else to give you a, yeah. uh, Hey, I was thinking about this. And they're like, have you tried this? Right. That's a good thing. I should try exactly. that. But it's a relationship. Right. relationship. Like right it needs to be a trusting relationship mm -hmm. to be able to be effective one thing i just wanted to say is on uh, my instagram and linkedin little otter my daughter rebecca who i founded little otter with she has adhd and we have done a series of videos where we're talking to each other about her experience as a child with adhd wow. and what it took for us to recognize it and what it felt like for me as a mom and you know, the ways that we were able to help her. And obviously right. she's like amazing. because she's, she's clearly amazing. Amazing. <laughs> but it's also just an example, like my kids, all each of my children have faced mental health challenges. So I've walked that walk of getting help, made mistakes. But also with Rebecca, she talks about the fact that we identified it and got her treatment early enough that it's really enabled her to um, to thrive as a grown up. So, mm. yeah. So I feel like sharing these stories is of one course. of the best ways to fight the stigma. Like it's not about you; it's about us. It's right. about you. It's yeah. all. Yeah. And our next question is from Annie. It's actually about ADD and it's about ADHD. So it's interesting you're bringing that up. Yeah. Um, but I've same experience in my household um, as that woman who called you that day, that eight year old woman, because my husband has horrible ADHD and it was not diagnosed until he was older. And he says, if everyone me. just thought I was just like being a crazy boy. Like he was like, I, yeah. I struggled so much. If, if it was just, it wasn't a thing then, you know? So yeah. I'm, we're already starting to see in our, my son and trying to get in there early and, you know, and, and work with that. Um, but Annie actually says that her son is going to be 14 next week. And they're currently in the process of seeing a counselor, seeing a psychiatrist for depression and a psychologist for either ADD or ADHD. He's never been on medication before. So as a mother, I'm stuck on what the best decision is. Do I put him on medication or keep pushing along since we have lasted this long without the medication? I think a lot of parents are worried about ADD. Yeah. Medicine. So this is a, a hard issue. The absolutely best treatment for mm -hmm. ADHD is medication in combination yeah. with therapy. And what happens, and this was true with my daughter also, you can go along at for a certain point where your child can kind of compensate potentially mm -hmm. without medication. But then as new demands come up, like starting mid middle right. school, right. starting high school. Oh, I lost my Dr. Helen. I mean, this is just, I mean, who doesn't love technology? This is absolutely amazing. But while we're waiting for them to come back, I can continue to speak on my experience with ADD and ADHD. Um, so, you know, my, my husband does, 
he's he's hesitant to continue to assume that my son is going to have it because he is sad that he that he had it and that it wasn't diagnosed and wants to think that he's okay and wants to think that he doesn't need help and you know i think like the dads and and dr helen and i were speaking about it is stigmatized and you don't want to need the help but i think the great thing about little otter is that you don't necessarily feel like you're getting that help there she is she's back yeah i'm back well but but i think what what yes kids need not only medication because there's right. a lot of um, skill learning both for parents and children my daughter benefited greatly from adhd coaching around organization literally oh, wow. she would bring her knapsack to her adhd coach and they would make you know help her learn these skills but i think that it's important for people to realize that stimulant medications which are the first line for adhd are the most studied pediatric medication. And, um, you know, but you really want to work with a pediatric psychiatrist who has experience, um, you know, treating ADHD to make sure that your child is is really getting the benefit from it. And I think that, you know, I think something that people are always worried about is, is it is is that it's not what you necessarily think that treatment and help and support from a place like little otter isn't going to always look like medicine and sitting with a shrink it can oh, be something a- like that or you know my son gets anxiety when he doesn't know what's going to happen so now his teacher lays out the day for him because if he doesn't see it oh. it gives him full-blown anxiety there's so many different ways to treat it's a, it's a lot around strategies we learn strategies to manage our anxiety we learn strategies and sometimes medication is helpful. Most, you know, that is in my view and in Little Otter's view, we don't do medication without the child and the family also being involved in some kind of support or therapy. We don't, right. we would never ever do that. So it's it's really important. But you know, speaking about your husband with ADHD, that's how we went to a marriage counselor because they were like, my big thing is my husband won't never closes the cabinet doors. And I'm like, you truly (laughs) must not love me because I've said this 5 million times. And, and the, the marriage counselor said, I actually think your husband has ADHD and he was, and it transformed his life. Does he leave the toilet seat up as well? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So we can talk, we can bond about being married to men with ADHD, but but I think it's, but I think there's what's, he has grief about the fact that it took so long to get identified because there's so much. And so we want for our children and we were able to do for our daughter to identify it early enough Mm -hmm. so she doesn't have to get into that seat with the marriage counselor and thinking like, you know, we're not going to make it as a family. So love, love a marriage counselor, by the way, saved my marriage. Oh yeah. And we do, as I said, <laughs> we do, we do marriage counseling, couples counseling. At I mean, it's like because... a massage for your brain. It's like, it's awesome. like, it's like yeah. a spa. I love going to see the marriage counselor. It's great. You get it all out and then you move on. Okay. So listen, this is our last question. Um, and this has been so amazing. I'm, I'm sad for it to be over, but we'll have tons more. Uh, this one is from Donna. She says, my husband has ADHD. Uh, the psychologist at my pediatrician office doesn't believe my three-year-old needs a diagnosis. She's scheduled use for workshops in improving our behavior responses when dealing with him, but will a former diagnosis help? Yes. Okay. It's just straight Not, up I yes. Mean, yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, definitely workshops and learning behavioral responses and working on parenting skills to parent a child with ADHD. And your child deserves to have a ADHD evaluation. We can we can diagnose ADHD from the age of three and up. Um, wow. I did not know so, it was that young. Yeah. So before we get out of here, um, can you tell people, how, you know, are we able to join and be a part of Little Otter even if... Maybe there's no issue yet. I mean, kind of just like that we end of the early we intervention. Our goal is to be um, available to every family to go through the ups and downs that every child and family has to um, help with preventing problems, to you know, learning skills when things are just becoming a bit of a problem, and then to identify when there are clinically significant challenges and get the help. And we. What is beautiful for little otter families is you can move into different phases, right? You don't, it's not like once you get care, you know, we, 
once you've had treatment and things are going well, then you could go down to, you know, a different level of care, but then you'd know we're there for you right. if, if you hit a speed bump. So, you know, our website is uh, littleotterhealth.com and we've got tons of free resources. You know, if you register, you can do our um, child and family mental health evaluation. And we just, we want to be here to help make, you know, tomorrow better for every kid and for every family. Well, I think you've already started to do that. So thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Helen. Thank you to Evan and Kevin. You guys are amazing. amazing. I want to hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and again, big thanks to Little Otter for putting together such yeah. an amazing, amazing event. And, and Nicole, thank you for doing such a beautiful job uh, moderating and, and also for you know, all three of you for being so open about your own experiences, because I think that really that's the best way we can help families to know that it's OK to have this conversation. Um, Absolutely. And trust me, you are not the only people dealing with these issues. <laughs> You're not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. This has been When to Worry, and we will see you guys next time. All right. Bye bye. Bye. bye.